It's very important that we understand this, that God knows you. He knows where you've been. He knows where you are. He knows where you are going. Um, it's a blessing, brethren, before we jump into this, just let me take a moment. It's a blessing to be with each other. And is it not a blessing to be reminded that our God has held this universe together for another week and has forgiven you your sin so that you can come and you can worship Him and be heard by Him? What a blessing. This week, I was talking to a young woman in about her mid-20s. Uh, I know her, her mother. Uh, they're not members of the body, but they are a, a religious people. And this daughter has been through a lot, this one that's in her mid-20s. In this past year, she's, she's witnessed her parents' marriage fall apart. There's been uh, multiple adulteries in, in the marriage, and uh, mother's about to put away the, the husband because of this. She was engaged, um, found herself pregnant, lost the baby, lost the engagement, and then within, all within a year, and then later on in this year, she was uh, sexually assaulted by someone else in a year. And she's also had seizures her whole life and recently had surgery, and this is the reason why we were sitting down talking. Her mom wanted to, to sit down and, and she wanted to talk with me a little bit because she's, she's panicking. She had this operation for the seizures, but she's panicking. She's very depressed. She becomes anxious. And matter of fact, whenever she came into the little Starbucks where I was working, she started to cry. And you could see just this panic. And I said, well, you know, obviously I'm not a doctor. You've got an appointment today. So luckily they're going to have an answer for you. And I'm sure there's going to be very reasonable uh, answer. I mean, you've had surgery. <laughs> there's no telling. I said, we are, we are wonderfully and fearfully made. So there's no telling what's going on. But then, you know, we all know people. And, and I thought to ask her, I said, are you, are you doing okay? Like, is there any anxiety or um, any feeling of guilt or sin that's occurring? And she begins to break down a little bit. Tells me some of the things that are going on. And I said, you know, that can cause a lot of an anxiety. That can cause a lot of depression. And it can come on sudden. Um, and, and sometimes not only our, our own sins, but the sins of others that have been pressed upon us in our lives can cause a lot of trauma. You've probably experienced that, and it can hit you like a ton of brick. And she ended up going to the doctor, and sure enough, the doctor said, everything's physically fine with you, and all this other stuff started coming out. And you know, it just reminded me, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world, is there not? Amen? There's a lot of people out there that are struggling. Some of these things that they're struggling with, it's their own doing. Some of the things that they struggle with are because of others. But here we are at the end of the day and people struggle. And we have a tendency to look at God and look at especially other people and say, you don't, you don't really know me, you don't get me. I mean, consider this girl. I mean, there are a lot of people that have experienced what she's experienced, but not everything together within a year. And she could easily look at me and say, you don't know me, Sean. And the reality is I don't. I don't know her, and I've not experienced a lot of those things she's going through. But what becomes really dangerous is when we begin to look at the Creator and say, and you don't know me either. And that's whenever everything begins to fall apart. And you know, Jesus knew something about that about people that did not know Him, that would not acknowledge Him. We're studying John right now in, in the, the adult class on the side. And be patient, but, but I want to read this passage with you. John chapter 8. I'm going to begin reading in verse 12. This seems to be um, perhaps shortly after uh, the Feast of Booths where they would have the procession of lights, and it's very fit, fitting that Jesus would proclaim, I am the light of the world. But he proclaims this in verse 12, and he says, Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, brethren, as I walk through this, I want you to notice how many times Jesus claims to come from the Father, be sent by the Father, but I also want you to pick up on, on what Jesus is trying to do for these individuals. 
So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. He answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, Therefore, where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. You hear that? You don't know me, you don't know my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. These words he spoke to them in the treasury. As he taught in the temple, no one arrested him because his hour had not come. He said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. Now, hear what he just said. You're going to die in your sin. So the Jews said, will he kill himself, since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. He said to them, you are from below, I am from above. They're thinking fleshly, Jesus is on the spiritual realm. You are of this world, I'm not of this world. I told, you, I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. So they're not, they're not listening. It doesn't matter how many times Jesus tells them, they're not listening. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. And they did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And as he was saying these things, many believed. Brethren, I want to say something before we get into the rest of this sermon. It's not about where I come from. It's about where he comes from. It's about where Jesus came from. And I have, I have realized in, in my study of John so far, up through chapter 8, he is already, this is already court recorded in like 28 plus verses. That Jesus continues to make this statement about who he comes from, who sent him. Here's what I would say to those that are struggling this morning if you're in our presence. Be at ease. Be at ease. Because Jesus knows you, and he knows where you come from. That is not the problem. There's a psalm that's been on my mind a lot lately that I've been working on, and that's Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Brethren, listen to his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Who satisfies you with good. So that your youth will be renewed like the eagles. Brethren, God knows you and he cares about you. He forgives all your iniquity. You know, I want you to notice that in order for Jesus to help these Jews who would, who would not listen to him, he was needing them to acknowledge something. Unless you believe I am, he, I am he, you will die in your sins. God can forgive the iniquity, but the first thing we have to realize is that we have to acknowledge that there is sin. Listen, he does not deal with us according to our iniquities, nor repay us according to our sins. But we have to realize them. These people wouldn't realize that. There are a lot of people that are in a bad situation, and it's because of what they have done. Well, you don't know me. You know what I learned from Adam and Eve? I learned that even whenever you put mankind in a perfect environment, we can turn the world into a ghetto. That's what I learned. We do a really good job of messing things up. And we do a really good job of running from the truth. Well, Jesus doesn't get me. You're right. In a sense, he doesn't get you. Because he walked the same road you, did, you, you walked and he did it perfectly. 
The reality is we don't get him. It's not that Jesus can't relate to us. We can't relate to him. Now, now this is a very comforting passage, but in Hebrews chapter 4, 14 through 16, there are true, two truths that we need to acknowledge this morning. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Don't tell me that Jesus doesn't get it. He gets it. But he walked the road perfectly. That's what we need to understand. But I want, you, I want you to see this, brethren. What kind of Lord is he? He's not one that just smacks you and just keeps you down and mocks you. He's actually sympathetic towards you. And that's what I want you to also hear. That's what I need to hear. Forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity. Listen, if you're struggling this morning with sin, the first thing to do is to recognize it. And you let God take care of the rest, and He will. Amen? But one thing that's very, very foolish is this. Don't lean on the fool who messed up like you did. Who walked the same road you have and messes up just like you do. Lean on the one who paved the way. (laughs) And He's waiting to help you, to be there for you who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. Jesus knew something about life. Now, you know, sometimes we have things that happen to us, and it's not because we sin, but but life has happened, or the sins of others have happened, and that's been cast upon us. And these are real things, and we feel them, and Jesus understood that. Um, I think one can make a pretty good argument that Jesus' father died at a young age, age. We, we don't ever read about Joseph like being present, physically present with Jesus after that whole scene when he was 12 years old at the temple. Now, he may very well have been alive, but it's weird. We read about Mary, and then Joseph is just absent from the rest of the gospel accounts. Very good chance he, he grew up many years without a physical father. Uh, they were poor. We, we learn in Luke's account that whenever he was presented at the temple, that his parents offered uh, two turtle doves or pigeons. That was allowed if you were poor. So, so he wasn't born with the, with the silver spoon, brethren. He wasn't. You want to talk about diseases and pits? It was our Savior that looked out. Remember on all the people? Like sheep without a shepherd? Helpless? And what did he do? He healed their diseases, and then he sat down and he taught them to get them out of the pit. Jesus knows something about pits. He knows something about diseases. He knows something about life and the turmoil. And brethren, forget not all his benefits, who heals you of all your diseases and redeems your life from the pit. Look at John chapter 11. Lazarus, you remember this, passes away. You remember his sisters, Mary and Martha. Let me just begin reading in verse 32. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved or or. He was indignant in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? (laughs) Jesus is there and he weeps. He's troubled. He looks at the disease, the pits of the world. He looks at death. He sees the consequences. He sees what befalls mankind. And he's indignant. And he's upset. And our Lord weeps. He cries. I read of beautiful men and women who weep over 
marvelous things. David, who wept over his God. Paul, who wept for his Lord and for his brethren. I read of our Christ, who weeps. You need to understand something. Do you think that Jesus still sees you? Do you think that he does not acknowledge the pits, the diseases? Husband struggling in a marriage whose wife won't love him? You think he doesn't see your struggle? You think he doesn't see you trying to walk the course or the wife struggling with a disobedient husband? You think he doesn't see you and these things have been thrown on your plate that are out of your control? Do you think that Jesus doesn't care anymore? Do you think he's no longer indignant? Do you think he no more longer weeps? Do you think he no, no longer smiles with you and rejoices with you and laughs with you? He's still in it. That's not the problem. He's always in it. I'm thankful today because another week where my God has not left me. And I believe that. Forget my soul. Forget not all his benefits. He's there. God knows you whole lot better than I know you, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. I read of the woman in John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman, that no Jew would have any dealings with, a Samaritan woman. I like how Josh had shared with me through his studies. You know what? God doesn't tell you her name, but he knew her name, and that's all that matters. Amen. Amen. But he spent the time with her. He showed her mercy. I read of the adulterous woman, the so-called adulterous woman in John chapter 8. A puppet in the hands of the Jew. They couldn't care less for this woman. If she lost her life, but Jesus was trapped in a scenario, they were okay with that. But Jesus tells her, you know what, I'm not going to sentence you to death. Go and sin no more. I read about the love I read about the mercy that our Lord bestows. I'm reminded of our brother James who said, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will have seen, receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. I read about Paul who says that I fought the good fight. And there's a crown of righteousness. Brethren, I know what kind of crown our Lord received from us. We gave him a crown of thorns. Don't tell me he doesn't get me. I know what we gave him. He gets you. Who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. This same image is found in Isaiah chapter 40. And, and you've got this hope for Judah, for God's people, that though they find themselves in captivity, there's, there's going to be a renewing of the Spirit. There's going to be a bringing back. That God will restore them. That there's light at that end of the tunnel. There's something to, to grab a hold of. And he says, why do you say, O Jacob, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even you shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Even these people who had turned their back on God, so merciful with them, so patient, looking to satisfy them, to feed them with good, looking to bring them back, looking to renew them. He's no different today than he was back then. We don't deserve that renewal, but he's wanting you to have it, to feast upon it, to be rejuvenated, to pick your head up and walk in the way, knowing that he lifts us, carries us every step of the way. By the grace of God, that we even st sit here for 25 to 30 minutes talking about what He can do for you, our 25 to 30 minutes will be rightfully just dedicated to Him and about His greatness. But He is so good that we can talk about how He's wanting to help you and I. And that's why we, we give glory to Him. 
and not ourselves. So brethren, it's not about God not knowing you. He knows you. The question is, do we know Him? That's, that's what I need to be concerned about. And so, if I may, let me go back to John chapter 8, and let me finish that passage with you. Bear with me. Let me read verse 31 through 47. So Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Brethren, I want you to notice as I read through this, Jesus isn't interested in, in trying to make them just humiliate them. He's trying to help them out. He's trying to set them free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? That's hilarious. Assyrian captivity, Babylonian captivity, the Roman government, and their slaves of sin more than that, as he's going to point out. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Oh, you have a slave master. Yeah, you do. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. But here's the fix. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I've seen with my father, and you do what you've heard from your father. Hold on. Abraham's our father. Well, if you're Abraham's children, you would be doing the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who had told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You were doing the works your father did. Well, we're not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, God. Well, if, you were, if God was your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? Is it because you cannot bear to hear my word? You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Brethren, I'll tell you something. And, and here's what needs to hit home. And just a few more passages, and then this sermon is, is yours. We need to be compassionate and be mindful of how God is there to help us and those to help outside who are struggling. But there's also another warning that we in the body have to be very careful of. Jesus struggled, majority of the time, with his own. The people that should have understood it, those are the people he had a hard time opening their eyes, opening their ears. They should have snatched this devour this truth quickly but they wouldn't how do you not know me we need to know him we need to abide in his word if we're his disciples we will follow and obey him brethren who among us doesn't need to hear this story. Just for the sake of time, Paul could give you his spiritual resume, right? In Philippians chapter 3, 4 through 11. From the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, Pharisee, zealous, he can keep going on. He'll give you another laundry list, I believe it's 2 Corinthians 11, of all the physical things he went through. He considers it trash, rubbish. In order to be known by Christ. I'm not interested in you knowing me. See, the reality is, his great physical resume, it wasn't that great. Because his, his, you ready for this? Here's Paul's whole story summed up. And your story and my story summed up in three words. You ready for them? Sin and separation. Sin and separation. There's not going to be righteousness found through what I've done, but it'll be found through faith in Christ. And brethren, we have got to be humbled. You want to talk about a unique story? Who has a unique story? The sinner separation group or the one who walked it perfectly? Who's got the unique story? 
That's the one we need to be studying. That's the one we need to be learning about. That's the one we need to lean on. That's the one we need to be talking to people about. It's good to let people know that you've fallen short, but make sure that you emphasize how he lifted you up and he forgave you. It's about him. This principle in Romans chapter 11, as Paul is warning the Jewish and non-Jewish Christian these people worshiping together and a message for all of us. I'll just sum this up. I apologize for going over a little bit. But in Romans 11, 13 through 24, we are reminded the same principle that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. Jesus is the root. Whether you're a natural branch, Jew, or a wild olive shoot, Gentile, you're all grafted into the root. <laughs> you know what? That's true. The natural branches' roots had been cut off because of their unbelief, and that allowed for the, the uh, wild olive shoot, the Gentiles, to come in according to God's plan. But hold on, Gentile, lest you become puffed up and say, well, they were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Paul says, that's true, but guess what? He'll cut you off just like he cut the natural branches off. And also remember this, he can graft the natural branches back in. So take note of the kindness and the severity of God and the kindness of given that you continue in the faith. We need to know God, brethren. Amen. God can graft you back in. God can graft you back in. Our God can attach you to that root for the first time. But we need to have an appreciation of what that means and our responsibility. And when we make those choices, can I just say this? Forget not all his benefits. Let me say it one more time. Who forgives all your iniquity. Sean can't do that for you. No one else in here could do that for you. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth will be renewed like the eagles. I can't do that for you, but Jesus can. And it is His invitation to you to be grafted in, to become part of His body, to confess He is in charge, not you. To be cleansed of your sins through the act of faith of baptism and walk behind Him, following Him for all eternity. This is your opportunity, and you can do it right now as together we stand and we sing.